In this section, I'm going to talk about what the server does in order to process a REST request. On this slide, I talk about how a server should process an incoming HTTP request. On the first row of the table, I just call out that if anything unexpected happens on the service, the server should return a 500 internal server error back to the customer. This usually happens because of an unhandled exception that's occurring on the server side. Everything below that though, the rows on the table, are typically checked in the order in which I show them on the table. So I won't go through them all in great detail, but you know, if the service is still booting or initializing, it's too busy or shutting down, then you would return a 503 service unavailable. Then you would check the HTTP version, then you check to see if authorization fails or not. I do wanna call out authorization though. Once you have authenticated the client, you know who they are. So anything that happens further down in the table, you can attribute it to somebody. For example, the next thing is checking to see if the client is making too many requests per second. Well, which client is making too many requests per second? You only know that after authorization has occurred, which client it is, right? So that's why we check authorization pretty early on in the process, knowing who the, uh, who the client is, is important for a lot of the remaining operations. Okay, um, and you might wanna use that for billing purposes. So you might even wanna bill customers even if they're sending you bad requests, right? Like URIs are too long or trying to call some operation that's not implemented and so on. You may still wanna bill them, so you need to authorize them to know who they are. Okay, so then there's a bunch of things like your URL's too long, uh, the method is not supported, the resource is not accessible to the client for some reason, the resource doesn't support this HTTP method, you could return a 405, method not allowed. Uh, let me say a little bit more about the 405 error code. It's allowed to be transient. That is, maybe you have a resource and it's currently in the process of doing something and the client wants to go and delete that resource. Um, but maybe delete is not valid right now. So then you could return a 405. Then maybe the resource completes what it's doing and delete will work later. So it's okay uh, for that scenario. And then finally, um, if you're gonna return a response back to the client, you should see the accept header that came in on the request to see if, it, if, uh, if the client accepts a format for which you support on the service. And if it doesn't, then you would return not acceptable. On this slide here, I continue the conversation of processing a incoming client request on the service, but now we start to throw the specific methods into the picture. For example, if this is a GET request that's coming in, the first thing you should do is check to see if there's an if none match header with an etag value, and if it matches, if it exists and it matches the etag on the current resource, then you return 304 not modified, and then you skip the rest of the table. For the other operations, patch, put, post, these operations all have a payload in the request body. So most of these other tests are checking to make sure that the content length header is there for that payload. Is the content length too big than what the service will accept? Is the content type of the payload a format that the service supports? For put and post, we usually accept JSON formats. For patch, we accept JSON merge patch formats. And then what the response code would be, of course, if any of these fails is the rightmost column. Um, you know, if the proposed JSON is invalid for the intended update, um, like let's say the customer is trying to update the creation date of something, but that's really set by the service and the client's a lot allowed to mutate that, then you would return a 422 unprocessable entity. For patch and put, if the resource ID is not creatable for some reason, then you would, could return a 404 not found. For delete, you're trying to delete something. Now I talked earlier in the course that we recommend that if you delete, if the customer tries to delete something that's not there, we recommend you still return a 200 or maybe a 204 in that case. Um, that's why I put delete in parentheses here. You could have your delete return a 404 if the resource doesn't exist, but normally we don't do that. We would just return success. Um, Okay, if the resource is not in an updatable or deleted state with patch or delete request, then you would return conflict. And then for the last two rows here, or, um, you, there's more e-tag e matching. Um, and if they don't, e-tags don't match, you would return a precondition failed. 
Um, the order of these, that is checking the if match header before checking the if none match header is described in RFC 7232. So this order uh, has to be like this in order to uh, be web standard. Finally, if you make it all the way to the bottom of the table, all the tests have passed, then you would pro process the resource in the proper desired way, possibly update the resources e-tag if it has one, talk more about e-tags later in the course. And then ultimately you would return a 200 or a 201 or a 204 or maybe even a 202 accepted. And that would be how you would process. Now, when you are returning a response payload as the, in the response, then of course um, you, that can be a resource but if it's one of those other error status codes, then you can't put the resource in the response. Instead, we recommend you put this Azure, um, this error response in instead, which is what Azure does. And this is following the OData protocol if you wanna look up more information for it. When your service is returning a non-success response back to the client, we recommend the service include an XMS error code header with some string in it. Now, the, the, that string, um, what you put there, depends on whether the error is recoverable or not recoverable at runtime. So some errors might be recoverable at runtime. Like, let's say you're trying to create a blob container, but the container already exists. So the call fails, but it fails because the container already exists. Well, usually that means the application can just recover from that gracefully and keep right on chugging along. So if the error is recoverable at runtime, the string that you should put here should be specific to that kind of error, and the client should write code to look for this string and to do some kind of graceful recovery. But there are certain kinds of errors that are not recoverable. Uh, for example, if the JSON payload is ill-formed, it's missing a quote or a comma or a closed brace, well, the client code isn't going to say, oh, I set the JSON bad, I know how to fix it and then resend it. That's not gonna happen. It's bad because the software developer writing the code must have forgotten to put in the, the closed brace. So in that case, if the service needs to return a response for something that is unlikely to be fixable at runtime by the client, then it can create some kind of strings that are buckets for a group of things, like a bucket such as bad JSON. And then in the message body here, it can say it's missing a closed brace or missing a comma. Again, a big part of the error handling here is to let customers who are writing code, uh, when they are testing their code, when they run into a problem, the error message should give them enough information so they can self-diagnose the problem and fix it right away without having to get customer support teams involved. And that gets the customer up and running very quickly and gives them a really good experience when working with your service. The string value that you return with the error code here, that must not change between versions. In other words, the response codes I talked about on the previous slides and the error code message here are part of your API contract. We've had some teams, for example, that spelled the string improperly and in a new version of the service, they fixed the spelling. You can't do that. That is a breaking change. Any customer code that was written looking for the old spelling will not match against the new spelling now and the customer code will no longer work correctly. So the MS error code header value, and which is identical to the code that's in this JSON payload in the response, those are part of your API contract and they must not change over versions. It's critically important. Now in the response here, um, we do have the code. The reason for the header is because it's easy for applications to just look at the header value. Um, if, uh, without having to deserialize or parse the JSON payload that's at the bottom. Um, but we do repeat the code in the payload because some applications might want to log the response payload and um, they can just log that without having to log the header. So we repeat the error code is the same value as the code. Um, everything else in the error response body is not part of the contract, meaning that the service can change the message, can change the target, can change the inner error, can do whatever it wants to in there. And we say to customers, this is not part of the contract. The only thing that's part of the contract is the header and the first code that's right underneath error in the response payload. 